On a morning in late October of 1999, 48-year-old Bruce Miller grabbed his car keys off the kitchen counter, quickly devoured a piece of toast, and then headed into the living room of his ranch-style home in the small town of Clio, Michigan. Bruce was over six feet tall and lanky, with graying hair and a mustache. He wore a button-up shirt, jeans, and work boots. Bruce walked towards the front door as his 28-year-old wife, Cherie, rushed into the room from the hallway. Cherie was short with dyed blonde hair and light eyes. Mornings were always a bit crazy in the Miller household. Cherie had two young children from a previous marriage, and so she had to get them ready for school, and Bruce was always in a hurry to get to the business that he owned. Bruce leaned down and kissed his wife, and Cherie's face lit up. But when she got a good look at Bruce's shirt, her face completely changed. Cherie reached up to the front pocket on Bruce's shirt, and she pulled out a huge wad of cash. Then she held the money up in front of Bruce and gave him a look like, I can't believe what you're doing. Everyone who knew Bruce knew he always carried a whole bunch of cash right in his front shirt pocket. Bruce said it was to make change for customers at work, but Cherie and others told him he was crazy to have that much cash just out in the open like that. It was like you're inviting getting robbed, and Cherie really wanted him to stop doing it. But Bruce smiled and took the money back from Cherie and slipped it right back into his shirt pocket. He told her he'd be fine, he kissed her again, and then walked outside into the cool fall air. Bruce could see the bright yellows and reds and the changing leaves on the trees, and so he knew the cold Michigan winter would be arriving soon. But for now, Bruce was enjoying the pleasant fall weather, and he felt like today was a perfect day to work outside. Bruce got into his car and drove a few minutes down the road to the outskirts of town. There, he turned off the main road onto a dirt road and drove for a couple more minutes until he finally arrived at the B&D salvage yard. Bruce drove through an open gate into the yard and parked his car in front of the small, one-story white building that served as the salvage yard's office. Bruce hopped out of his car and surveyed the yard. Abandoned vehicles and stray auto parts stretched out in heaps and rows for acres. Bruce smiled. He never felt more at home than when he was right there. Bruce loved everything about cars. He loved watching NASCAR races, he loved driving, but most of all, he loved working on cars that other people thought were beyond repair. And so Bruce had always felt like having a salvage yard would be like having a personal playground. And so that was actually why, years earlier, he and a business partner had gone ahead and bought this salvage yard. But Bruce didn't just see this yard as a place for him to have fun and work on old beat-up cars. Instead, he saw it as the key to his and Cherie's future. Bruce had spent the last 30 years of his life, since he was about 18 years old, working for General Motors, or GM. At the time, GM was the top-selling automotive manufacturer in the entire United States, and it was one of the largest employers in the state of Michigan. In the three decades that Bruce had worked there, he'd held a range of different positions, and he had done really well. Bruce had loved working for GM from the time he started as a teen. It allowed him to be around cars all the time, and it had given him a chance to save a good amount of money. But after 30 years on the job, Bruce was ready to start a new phase of his life. And so that was where the salvage yard came in. Bruce had already reduced his time at GM, but he planned to walk away entirely within the year. And so at that point, the salvage yard would have to become his primary revenue stream. But Bruce was optimistic because historically, people from all across the area flocked to the B&D salvage yard to get good deals on used automotive parts or to just buy old cars and trucks that they wanted to try to fix up themselves. Standing outside his office, Bruce gazed out over the piles of metal that looked like they went on forever. He knew a lot of people saw this yard as nothing more than a dump a place that was filled with junk that had no use. But Bruce saw potential in that junk. He knew that with hard work and a little care, almost any car part could be made as good as new. And in some ways, Bruce felt like he owed his entire life to the discarded car parts on that lot. Because when he had bought the salvage yard, it ended up giving him way more than just a potential retirement plan. Years earlier, when he'd just become the new owner of the yard, Bruce had gone to the office to meet his employees and the young, blonde bombshell who took care of the financial books for the salvage yard almost stopped him in his tracks. Her name was Cherie, and Bruce could just not stop staring at her. So, not long after that day in the office, he had asked Cherie out. And as he had gotten to know Cherie more, he had fallen in love with every aspect of her, not just her looks. Cherie was kind and caring in a way that Bruce just wasn't used to. 
He had actually been married three times before, and he always felt like his ex-wives had been purposely cruel to him. But Cherie was different. She spent her time when she wasn't working, just trying to help people. She took care of her two young kids, she had worked for years at a local retirement community, and she did everything she could to advocate for victims of child abuse. Cherie had witnessed child abuse at different periods of her life, and she felt compelled to stand up for kids who could not stand up for themselves. And it was her dream to someday make or raise enough money to start a nonprofit organization that was dedicated to helping victims of child abuse across the country. When Bruce and Cherie had really begun dating, it became clear pretty quickly that they both wanted to spend the rest of their lives together. So, earlier that year, in 1999, they had gotten married. And Bruce had begun to see the salvage yard as an opportunity for Cherie to realize her dream of starting her own nonprofit. So, not long after the wedding, Bruce and Cherie had bought out Bruce's business partner and taken over full ownership of the salvage yard themselves. They hoped the money they would make from the yard would allow Bruce to fully walk away from GM and enable Cherie to become a full-time advocate. Bruce took in one more breath of fresh air and then walked inside the office. Inside, it looked like the place had not been updated or even really cleaned in years. There were stained walls and boxes and supplies and files sticking out all over the place, and there were all these beat-up metal tables with ashtrays on them that were overflowing with cigarette butts, but it still felt like Bruce's happy place. Bruce said hello to the woman who now handled the financial books for him, but he could tell she was upset about something. Bruce asked her what was wrong, and she said when she was going over recent sales, she was sure that some auto parts, including some tires, had disappeared without being paid for. Bruce shook his head. Despite keeping the yard gated and locked when nobody was there, theft was often just part of this business. But Bruce was angry because he was sure he knew who had taken off with the parts in question. So Bruce walked to the cluttered front counter, sat down in a swivel chair, picked up the phone, and called a man named John Hutchinson. John had been an employee at the salvage yard when Bruce first took over, and almost right from the start, the two men had clashed. At first, Bruce didn't understand what John's problem was. After all, Bruce was a pretty laid-back guy who did his best to get along with everyone, but eventually, Cherie had told Bruce that she knew why John didn't like him. Cherie and John had once dated. And even though Cherie had broken things off, she believed John still had a thing for her, and so he was jealous when she and Bruce had started dating. Even with that news, Bruce still tried to get along with John. He felt like it wasn't right to just get rid of John simply because, at one point, he had dated Cherie. But after a short time of working together, John had basically given Bruce no choice. The two men just kept clashing at work, and then Bruce discovered that John was selling parts from the yard to his friends and family for way below asking price. And then John had just begun outright stealing things from the yard. So Bruce had fired John. But the stealing didn't stop. John knew every way in and out of the salvage yard, and even though Bruce couldn't prove it, he was pretty sure John was still ripping him off. Bruce clutched the phone tight when he heard John's voice on the other line. And within a few seconds, the two men were screaming at each other on the phone. Bruce accused John of stealing, and John denied that he had done anything, and he attacked Bruce for firing him out of sheer jealousy. Finally, Bruce slammed the phone down and took a deep breath. Then he walked outside, made his way through the salvage yard, and began to look for a car to work on to take his mind off the fight he'd just gotten into. And after spending a large chunk of his day outside in the beautiful fall weather working on cars, Bruce did feel a lot better. So, by the time Bruce got home that night and had dinner with Cherie and her two young kids, he was able to stay calm when he told Cherie about the phone call he'd had with John. Cherie said she was sorry he had to deal with that, that she couldn't help but feel a bit responsible for the trouble John continued to cause her husband. But Bruce told her, don't worry, it was not her fault at all. Later that night, after Cherie and Bruce got the kids to bed, Cherie suddenly had this huge smile come across her face, and before Bruce could ask her why she was so happy, she just grabbed his hand and led him into their small home office. There, Cherie went to the computer on the old wooden desk and turned it on and waited for the dial-up internet to connect. Then, after it connected, Cherie, still with her huge grin on her face, pulled up an internet chat room and pointed at the screen for Bruce to see. Back in 1999, the internet was really just starting to take hold in the United States, and more people than ever before were connecting with each other online. 
mostly through instant messaging services and also through chat rooms where people could meet others who shared the same interests. Being 20 years younger than her husband, Cherie had grown up loving video games, she'd gotten into computers as soon as they became common in households across the U.S., and now she loved the internet. And recently, Cherie had found a number of chat rooms where she said she could talk to people from all over the country and maybe even all over the world who were also advocates for victims of child abuse. And so that was what she was pointing at on the screen, was one of those chat rooms. Cherie told John that she believed the internet and her ability to connect with these other people would make it a lot easier for her to learn the best ways to establish and run the advocacy group she had dreamed about starting. Bruce looked at the screen and then smiled, hugged Cherie, and gave her a kiss. He didn't really understand the point of the internet or chat rooms, but Cherie knew way more about it than he did, so if she believed the internet could be an effective tool, then he was happy for her. That night, as they lay in bed, Bruce and Cherie talked about how they felt like their future plans were really starting to fall into place. Bruce was sure he'd be able to make the salvage yard his only job soon, and Cherie would get to help more children on a much larger scale. They just had to keep working hard and being patient, and eventually, everything would work out just like they had planned. On the afternoon of Monday, November 8, 1999, so a couple of weeks after Bruce and John had fought on the phone, Bruce headed out to the salvage yard. He was exhausted because he'd worked a late shift at General Motors the night before, but he still wanted to go into the yard to check on business and to spend some time working on an old car. Bruce drove through the gate and parked his car in front of the office. He stepped outside, breathed in the fresh air, and immediately began to feel a bit more awake. Then he walked into the office and saw his wife sitting behind the front counter. Cherie smiled, stood up, walked around the counter, and gave her husband a big kiss. She had opened up the salvage yard that morning after she dropped off the kids at school. That way Bruce could get some extra sleep after his late night at GM the night before. Cherie said it had been a pretty quiet day so far, then she told Bruce she'd see him later at home. After Cherie was gone, Bruce checked in with the one other employee who was in the office, and then Bruce went to the yard to spend the rest of the day working outside. A little after 5 p.m., so just as the sun was setting below the horizon, Bruce decided it was time to head back inside the office to get some paperwork done before he went home. When he went in there, the one employee was still inside, and so Bruce told them they could head home and that Bruce would stick around and close up the yard on his own. And so after the employee thanked him and left, Bruce sat down in his old metal swivel chair and began digging through a stack of papers on the front counter, looking for a few forms that he needed to sign. About an hour later, at 6 p.m., Bruce was still inside the office doing paperwork when the office phone rang. Bruce answered, and he heard his wife's voice on the other line. She told him that the kids really wanted pizza from their favorite restaurant for dinner that night, and so she would call the order in if he could just pick it up on the way home. Bruce said that sounded great and that he would and that he'd close up shop in just a few minutes. Cherie told Bruce she loved him and they both hung up. Bruce pulled out a cigarette and lit it and then exhaled a puff of smoke and then glanced back down at the paperwork on his desk to make sure he'd finished everything he wanted to. But as he was doing this, suddenly the front door to the office swung open, someone stepped inside and the door slammed shut behind them. A little after 8 p.m., so two hours after Cherie had talked to Bruce on the phone about pizza, she paced around her living room. The kids were sitting in the kitchen, still waiting for pizza, and Bruce had still not arrived home. Cherie went to the kitchen, grabbed the phone, and called the salvage yard. She told the kids that Bruce must have been delayed with a last-minute customer, but as she sat there, the phone just kept on ringing and nobody picked up. So eventually, Cherie hung up, called Bruce's brother, and asked if he had heard from Bruce. The two brothers talked all the time, especially about football, and Cherie knew there was a big Monday night football game on. But Bruce's brother surprisingly said they actually had not spoken at all that day. But Bruce's brother could tell Cherie sounded very worried, so he tried to calm her down. He said Bruce was most likely somewhere between the salvage yard and the pizza place, or maybe he had already gotten the pizza and he was on his way home. But either way, he was probably just fine. And so after that, they hung up. But Cherie did not feel any calmer. So she grabbed the kids, put them in her car, and drove to the pizza place. 
But she didn't pass Bruce on the way, and when she got to the restaurant, they told her that Bruce had never come in to pick up the order. Cherie grabbed the pizza and then raced back home with the kids and immediately called her brother-in-law again. And this time, when he heard Cherie's voice, he could tell she was far more anxious, and he admitted to her, after hearing what had just happened, that this did seem pretty strange. So he told Cherie that he and his wife would go right now over to the salvage yard to just check on things. A few minutes after that phone call, Bruce's brother and his wife drove through the open gate at the salvage yard, and right away they spotted Bruce's car still parked out in front of the office. Now, the sight of his car made Bruce's brother actually feel better. He figured Bruce must have gotten caught up with work, and he must have just been on the phone with somebody else when Cherie had tried calling him. Bruce's brother and his wife stepped out of their car and walked up to the office door, and right away they froze because when they looked down, they could see the front door to the office was actually cracked open a bit, and they knew Bruce never left this door open when he was working alone at night because of all the theft. And so this was a big red flag. Bruce's brother and his wife began calling out Bruce's name through this gap in the door, but nobody answered from inside. So the couple nodded to each other and then pushed the door open and stepped into the office, and right away they saw a huge pile of cigarette butts on the floor in front of the counter. Then they walked around the counter and looked down at the floor, and when they did, they just stood there in total shock. Bruce was sprawled out on the floor in a thick pool of blood. Bruce's brother instinctively dropped down to try to revive Bruce, but he already knew Bruce was dead. Bruce's sister-in-law's hands started shaking uncontrollably, but she still managed to grab the phone on the front counter and dial 911. About an hour after the 911 call, Detective Sergeant Ives Petrovka of the Genesee County Sheriff's Department drove down a dirt road towards the salvage yard. And as Petrovka got closer, he began to look around and think to himself that the salvage yard at night seemed kind of menacing. These huge piles of metal rising up into the sky, creating paths and hidden corners everywhere that made it impossible for somebody there to ever really know if they were actually alone. Petrovka drove through the open gate and parked his car near the front office, where a local police cruiser with flashing lights was already parked near several other state police vehicles. Petrovka stepped out of the car and saw fellow Sheriff's Department detective Kevin Shanlian pull into the lot behind him. Petrovka's tie was hanging loose, and he always looked like he was in a hurry. In contrast, Shanlian was very calm and was the kind of person who never had a hair out of place. But despite their huge differences, the two detectives got along well. In the parking lot, Petrovka and Shanlian walked over to the first officer who had arrived at the scene. The officer was standing outside of the office with Bruce's sister-in-law and his brother, who both still looked like they were in shock. Petrovka introduced himself and said he was sorry to ask them to stay longer, but he would probably need to ask them some questions shortly. Bruce's brother nodded blankly and said that he and his wife would stick around to help. Then Petrovka and Shanlian walked into the office. The cramped office felt like it was totally packed with people, even though there were only a few members of the state crime lab forensics team inside. The county detectives introduced themselves, and a woman from the crime lab who had short hair and a quiet voice motioned for them to join her on the other side of the front counter. Petrovka and Shanlian took a few steps across the office, avoiding the pile of cigarette butts on the floor, and walked around the counter. There, they saw Bruce's body, and by Bruce's head was another pile of cigarette butts. The forensics officer was crouched down over Bruce's body. She was using pieces of one-sided tape to pull potential hair samples from Bruce's shirt. But Petrovka barely noticed what she was doing because he was stunned by the amount of blood covering Bruce's chest, the floor, and the wall behind Bruce's body. Even at first glance, it was clear to the detectives that Bruce had been shot at close range with a powerful weapon, most likely a shotgun. But no expended shells had been found at the scene. The forensics officers cataloged and stored hair samples from Bruce's shirt, and then the woman with the quiet voice motioned for the detectives to follow her back to the front door. They walked around the counter, and then the woman told them to take a look at the office from where they were standing. And then when they began doing this, she asked them if anything jumped out at them. The one thing that really jumped out at Detective Petrovka was what a mess the place was. 
There were papers overflowing from boxes. There were ashtrays that looked like they hadn't been emptied in weeks scattered all across these small tables and grease and oil stains all over the floor. The forensics officer said Petrovka was exactly right. The place was a complete mess, which is why she was surprised that they hadn't found any fingerprints or physical evidence on the front door where the killer would have had to enter and exit. And she said what was even stranger was that they had not found any footprints in the grease and oil stains on the floor. Normally, those types of stains were very effective at capturing prints. And so Petrovka and Shanlian assumed, based on this information, that whoever had killed Bruce must have taken time to really wipe the place down afterwards. The forensics officer said that would explain the door being totally clear of prints, but she didn't find any evidence that the floor had been cleaned. Instead, she thought whoever had killed Bruce had known where the grease stains were on the floor, and so they had just avoided stepping in them. Petrovka glanced over at Shanlian with a very knowing look on his face. They both knew if that theory checked out, that somebody knew where these stains were, then that meant they were very likely looking for someone who knew Bruce and who was familiar with this office. So the detective stepped outside to talk to the people who had found Bruce's body, his brother and his sister-in-law. Outside in the salvage yard, Bruce's brother saw the detectives walking his way, and so he tried to pull himself together. Since finding his brother dead inside of the office, Bruce's brother and his wife had pretty much just been in shock and had barely even spoken to each other. But when Petrovka asked Bruce's brother why they had been at the salvage yard in the first place, he told the detective that Bruce's wife, Cherie, had called him twice in a panic because Bruce had not come home from work. So he and his wife said they would go check out the salvage yard to see what was going on, and that's when they found Bruce's body. As he spoke, Bruce's brother choked back tears. He told the detectives that he'd already called his mother to tell her that Bruce was dead, but that he couldn't bring himself to say what had happened to him. So he just told her that they thought Bruce might have had a heart attack. After speaking with Bruce's brother and sister-in-law for several minutes, Petrovka and Shanlian felt like these two witnesses were telling the truth. It was way too early to actually rule anyone or anything out, but the detectives felt like they'd learned everything they could from Bruce's brother and his wife for the time being. And so now, the detectives wanted to talk to Bruce's wife, Cherie, to see if she had any information that could help. The detectives thanked Bruce's brother and his wife for coming and talking to them, and then the detectives got into their cars and headed towards town. It was well after midnight on November 9th, so several hours after Bruce's body had been discovered, when Petrovka and Shanlian stepped inside of Bruce and Cherie's house. The detectives stood in the living room, and Cherie sat on the couch. Her face was pale, almost gray, and she looked totally lost. Cherie had heard about what happened to Bruce from her mother-in-law, and then also a uniformed police officer had come by her house to confirm the news. But neither of them had told Cherie what actually happened. All they told her was that her husband was dead. However, now, the two detectives told Cherie what they actually found at the crime scene. And Cherie would tell them that she had been terribly worried about her husband when he didn't come home, but she never imagined anything as horrible as what they had just told her. Petrovka leaned down in front of Cherie and told her how sorry he was for her loss, and he was sorry that she had not been informed properly about what happened. Then suddenly, Cherie looked right at Petrovka, and she seemed way more alert than she had since the detectives got there and she asked Petrovka if they had found a large amount of cash in Bruce's shirt pocket. Petrovka said they had not found any money, at which point Cherie explained that her husband always had like a couple of thousand dollars in cash in that front pocket. Petrovka asked if anybody else knew this, and Cherie nodded vigorously. She said most of Bruce's friends and family knew about his habit of carrying around a whole bunch of money, and anybody who worked at the salvage yard would also know that too. The detectives shared a quick glance. The evidence the forensics officers had found made them pretty sure whoever had killed Bruce knew him and knew the layout of the salvage yard office. So Petrovka asked Cherie if she could think of anyone who knew Bruce who also might have had it out for him or who might have just wanted to rob him. Cherie closed her eyes and thought for a second, and then she looked back up at Petrovka and told him there actually was one man who could not stand her husband. He was a former employee at the salvage yard who actually she had once dated, and she said his name was John Hutchinson, and he had a history of stealing from her husband. 
Petrovka thanked Cherie for her help and told her again how sorry he was for her loss. Then he and Shanlian headed outside to their cars. Back at the sheriff's station, the two detectives talked about what Cherie had told them, and they agreed that this John Hutchinson guy seemed to fit the description of who they were looking for. Someone who knew Bruce, who knew the salvage yard, and who literally had a history of stealing from Bruce before. And so certainly this guy John would also know that Bruce carried thousands of dollars in cash on his person. So by the time the sun started to rise that morning, the detectives believed they had identified their very first major suspect. At 1.30 p.m. on November 9th, the day after Bruce's murder, Detective Shanlian led John Hutchinson into a small interrogation room at the sheriff's station. John was tall with a square jaw, a shaved head, and piercing eyes. People who knew him said he was good-looking enough to be a Hollywood star. Shanlian motioned for John to take a seat at a small table in the center of the room, and Shanlian then sat down across from him. The room was warm, and John was already sweating, but Shanlian figured that might have more to do with nerves than with the room's temperature. Shanlian was very calm, and he had an ability to put people at ease really quickly, which is why he'd been chosen to conduct this interview. Shanlian said he knew John was nervous, and that was totally normal. Shanlian said he was not going to try to trick John or get him to say anything that wasn't true. He just needed John to answer a few simple questions. John nodded and said he wanted to help. During the course of the interview, Shanlian got John to talk about his past relationship with Cherie, and he even got him to admit that he had, in fact, stolen auto parts from the salvage yard before. But John also said that he had owed Bruce money. When Shanlian heard that, he barely reacted, but inside, he thought that that information made John an even more likely suspect. Then, Shanlian asked John if he owned any weapons. John said he was a hunter, so yes, he had several rifles and a shotgun. Now, at this point, Shanlian knew Bruce had been killed with a shotgun, so he leaned forward and started to press John a little bit harder. He asked a series of rapid-fire questions, keeping the focus on John's past with Cherie and his strained relationship with Bruce. But John kept insisting that, you know, whatever issues he'd had with Bruce, none of them would have led John to kill Bruce. He even said that Bruce had always been pretty cool to him and that he himself was probably to blame for the tension between them. Then, without prompting from Shanlian, John stood up and said, hey, can I take a lie detector test? He'd seen on TV and movies that a lie detector test could prove he was innocent. Shanlian said he would have to make a quick call first, but he was pretty sure they could schedule a polygraph test for John that day. So John sat back down and said the test would make it clear he really did have nothing to do with Bruce's murder. At this point, Shanlian nodded, got up, and walked out of the room. But he didn't leave to go set up the polygraph test just yet. Instead, he joined the other members of the investigative team behind a two-way mirror that looked into the interrogation room where John was. And when Shanlian looked through that mirror, he saw something that totally threw him for a loop. John was sitting in the interrogation room alone, and then suddenly he just bent over and began sobbing. And the sobbing didn't stop, and it went on for so long that eventually Shanlian and the others decided that this guy must be having a total breakdown. Finally, after several minutes, it seemed like John was beginning to calm down, and so Shanlian stepped away from the mirror and went and scheduled the polygraph test, and then he returned to the mirror looking back into the interrogation room. By this point, John had managed to calm himself down a bit, but it was clear he just could not stop crying. Shanlian and the others had no idea if this guy was just totally racked with guilt over something he had done, or if maybe just the pressure of being in this interrogation room had caused him to kind of snap. A little later that day, John would sit down for his polygraph test, but he would keep changing his answer to every question, and then by the end of the test, it was clear John had just failed. And so, Detective Shanlian and Petrovka became even more convinced that they had found Bruce's killer. On November 13th, 1999, five days after Bruce's murder, Members of the investigative team stood amongst Bruce's friends and family in a cemetery for Bruce's funeral. Bruce's casket was driven through the cemetery on the back of a flatbed truck, and inside the closed casket, Bruce was dressed in a black Dale Earnhardt jacket. Dale Earnhardt had always been Bruce's favorite NASCAR driver. 
Everyone there thought the entire funeral was the perfect send-off for a man who had loved cars as much as Bruce. Detectives Petrovka and Shanlian listened as Bruce's brother talked about how happy Bruce had been in the final days of his life. Bruce's business was doing well, and he finally saw a future where he could be his own boss at a place he loved. And Bruce's brother said that after years of searching and many failed marriages, Bruce had finally found the woman of his dreams in Cherie, and that Bruce had really come to love her kids like they were his own. Hearing about how loving Bruce had been to his family and friends really made Petrovka and Shanlian want to bring his killer to justice as soon as they could. They knew nothing would ever bring Bruce back, but his family deserved some kind of closure. And with their main suspect, John Hutchinson, right in their sights, the detectives thought they were very close to actually solving this case. But in the following weeks, Petrovka and Shanlian could not find any evidence that directly linked John to the scene of the murder. Now, they didn't think this proved that John was innocent, really kind of the opposite. They thought this just showed that John really did know how to cover his tracks at the salvage yard. They even brought John in for a second polygraph test, and he failed it again. Still, investigators and the district attorney didn't think they had nearly enough evidence to actually convict John if this case went to court. So, as 1999 came to an end, Bruce's murder remained unsolved. At that time, Detective Petrovka had been training in the relatively new field of computer forensics, an investigative practice that looks at data and evidence from computer devices potentially used in crimes. And Petrovka had proven to be quite good at computer forensics, and he had set his sights on working for state authorities in this new field. But he made it clear to Shanlian and the rest of the investigative team that he was still fully committed to Bruce's case. He wanted to bring Bruce's killer to justice. But as January 2000 passed by with still no more new evidence linking John Hutchinson to the murder, both Petrovka and Shanlian began to worry that maybe they had set their sights on the wrong person. On February 17th, 2000, so over three months after Bruce's murder, Petrovka was sitting at his desk when he got a call from a police officer in nearby Flint, Michigan. As Petrovka listened to the officer on the other line, he couldn't help but feel really confused. The Flint officer said he'd received a call from an attorney who worked in a small town in Missouri. That attorney had spoken to local law enforcement in that Missouri town, and they had told him that they'd stumbled onto a case that they believed was somehow linked to Bruce Miller's murder in Michigan. And so after this officer explained everything they could to Petrovka, Petrovka hung up the phone feeling pretty excited, but also still feeling pretty confused. How could anything in this random small Missouri town be connected to this Michigan murder case he had been working on for months? But nonetheless, Petrovka pushed forward and contacted the local police department in that Missouri town, as well as the county sheriff's department that had jurisdiction in that area. Then, after talking to both of those departments, Petrovka rushed over to Shanlian's desk and told him they might have a huge break in the Bruce Miller case. Petrovka said he was going to book a flight to Missouri, and he would know more when he got back. The following day, Petrovka was in Missouri, meeting with detectives and sitting in on interviews regarding a suicide that had happened in this small town. And this suicide was the case that police believed was linked to Bruce's murder. And sure enough, by the time Petrovka returned to Michigan a couple of days later, he was absolutely positive he knew who had killed Bruce and how they'd done it. Based on evidence collected from the scene of the suicide in Missouri and the murder scene at the salvage yard and interviews conducted throughout the investigation into Bruce Miller's death, here is a reconstruction of what authorities believe happened on the night someone murdered Bruce Miller, November 8th, 1999. On that day, at around 2 p.m., the killer pulled into a rest stop in Flint, Michigan. The killer stepped out of their car and stretched their legs. They had been driving nonstop for over 10 hours. After stretching, the killer walked across the parking lot to the rest stop payphone. They put a coin in, dialed a number, let it ring once, and then hung up. The killer then stepped away from the phone, walked over to a picnic table, sat down, and waited. 
The air was cool, and the killer felt relaxed for the first time since they'd started driving earlier that morning. A few minutes later, the killer saw a car pull into the same rest stop parking lot they were in, and they watched as a person got out of that car and walked right towards them. The killer stood, and the person who had just arrived handed them a cell phone. Then the person headed back to their car, and the killer slipped that cell phone into their jeans pocket and then sat back down at the table. After sitting at the rest stop for hours, that cell phone in the killer's pocket began to ring. Killer calmly pulled it out and answered the call. They spoke to the person on the other line, and then afterwards the killer walked to their car. At about 6.45 p.m., almost five hours after arriving at that rest stop, the killer cut their headlights off as they drove down the dirt road leading to the salvage yard. They pulled through the open gate and parked their car several yards away from the office. The killer stepped out of the car, walked around to the back, and opened up the trunk. They reached inside and pulled out a shotgun. The killer closed the trunk, and then they marched right up to the front door of the office. They threw it open and slammed it shut behind them. Bruce, who was inside the office, looked up from behind the counter right as the killer raised that shotgun and fired. A deafening bang echoed off the walls inside the office, and the shell from the shotgun struck Bruce right in the throat. Blood and gore spilled and spattered on the floor and walls. The force from the shot actually spun Bruce's metal swivel chair around, and his arm hit an ashtray as he tumbled from the chair to the floor, scattering cigarette butts on both sides of the counter. The killer took a breath and lowered the shotgun. Then they looked down at the floor and took note of several grease stains. Then they stepped around the counter, being very careful to avoid those grease stains. Once the killer had made it around to the back of the counter, they stared down at Bruce, and they were sure he was dead. So the killer reached into their pocket, grabbed that cell phone, and made a call. They let it ring once, and then hung up. The killer then slipped the phone back into their pocket, walked to the front door, avoiding the grease stains again, and walked back outside to their car. The killer put the shotgun back in the trunk, then they got into the driver's seat and began the 10-hour drive back to where they had come from. And as the killer's car headed down the highway into the darkness, the person who had delivered the cell phone to the killer at that rest stop walked into their kitchen, and they told their two kids that Bruce, their stepfather, would be home soon with their pizza. Bruce's wife, Cherie, had orchestrated Bruce's murder. It would turn out that Cherie had not been using those online chat rooms to find other people who were advocates for victims of abuse. Instead, she had been visiting chat rooms to play out her sexual fantasies with men from all across the country. And whenever she found a man she liked, she would send them explicit photos of herself online, and she would also literally mail them explicit videotapes of herself because in 1999, most people were not sharing videos online yet. And one man in particular who had met Cherie in one of these chat rooms and who had received photos and videos from her had fallen totally in love with her. He was 39 years old from Missouri and his name was Jerry Cassidy. After talking for a few weeks via chat rooms and an online direct messaging service, Cherie and Jerry had carried out their digital affair in real life. Cherie had flown to a couple of different cities to meet and have sex with Jerry. And when Cherie was with Jerry, she concocted this far-fetched fantasy life for herself in which her husband, Bruce, was actually this powerful member of an organized crime family who regularly beat her and threatened to kill her. Then, a couple of months before Bruce's murder, Cherie sent a message to Jerry to tell him she was pregnant with Jerry's baby. She even sent him a picture online showing a positive pregnancy test and an ultrasound. But not long after sending those along, Cherie would again message Jerry to tell him that Bruce had beaten her so badly that she had lost their baby. She had used makeup to create bruises all over her body and then sent photos of those bruises to Jerry. And Cherie told Jerry that she would never be safe and they could never be happy together until Bruce was dead. And after seeing these horrible photos of Cherie with all these bruises on her and believing that he and Sherry had just lost their child, Jerry agreed to go kill Bruce. So via online direct messages, Cherie planned the entire murder with Jerry. She chose the rest stop where they would meet. She bought the cell phone he would use to let her know the job was done. 
and she was the one to tell Jerry to make sure he didn't step in any of those grease stains on the salvage yard office floor. And so Jerry would carry out the murder, and then afterward, he waited patiently for Cherie to come join him in Missouri. But in the weeks and months following the murder, Cherie started ignoring Jerry, and she eventually told him that she actually didn't want to be with him anymore. Feeling alone, betrayed, and totally riddled with guilt, Jerry took his own life. And so when local police arrived at Jerry's apartment in Missouri after receiving a call from one of his family members, they would find a Bible next to Jerry's body. The Bible was open to a verse in the Gospel of Matthew that read, quote, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, end quote. Then, police also found a videotape in Jerry's trash can, and when they played the tape, they saw a scantily clad Cherie making explicit sexual comments directly to Jerry. That's when Missouri authorities learned about the murder of Cherie's husband in Michigan, at which point they contacted that Flint police officer, who then called Detective Petrovka. After returning from Missouri, Petrovka confiscated Cherie's computer, and using his skills in computer forensics, he was able to uncover the entire murder plot that she had carried out with Jerry online. Cherie was ultimately convicted of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2055. From prison, Cherie would admit her guilt. She said Bruce had been a good man and had never done anything wrong, she said she had just convinced herself that her online life was like a video game and that killing Bruce had become like beating the final level. Some in the media would come to call this case the first murder in the United States that was planned on the internet. This case would alert authorities to the alarming speed at which conspirators could communicate and plan simply by using direct message services and online chat rooms. And so as a result, U.S. law enforcement agencies would greatly increase their investment in the growing field of computer forensics. In 2003, 27-year-old Kurt Smith was employed as an engineer for the German shipping company called Hapag Lloyd. Over the past year, he had completed two separate four-month-long deployments with this company, and he enjoyed the work enough that he asked for a contract extension. It was granted, and on July 11th of that year, he boarded the CM London Express to begin his third deployment. Three months into it, one of the ship's pistons broke. The piston is the part of the engine that goes up and down inside the hollow cylinder of the engine block. They would need to turn off the engine in order to make this repair, and so they made an unplanned stop in Savannah, Georgia. Once they got there, Kurt, along with seven people under his command, headed down to the engine room to begin the process. Over the next several hours, the men were able to extract the broken piston and put in the new one. But this was backbreaking work. It was so hot in the engine room. What they're moving around is so heavy and cumbersome and they're all bickering with each other. And at some point, Kurt called out the foreman for being lazy and the foreman did not like that. And he was very popular amongst this group. And so by the end of getting the piston back in, everybody in there just totally resented Kurt. But ultimately, they got it done, and Kurt cut everybody loose, except for the foreman. He told him he needed to stay back and help him ensure all the pistons were properly installed. To do that, they would need to go inside of something called the scavenger air receiver, which is this tube that's 55 feet long by 5 feet wide with access hatches on either side, and it sits right next to the engine block. Each hatch on either end had three latches on the outside that were called dogs. And so Kurt undid the three dogs on his hatch and he opened it up. He crawled inside of the tube with his flashlight and he began crawling. And on his left side were these square cutouts, these windows called scavenger ports that looked into each of the engine cylinders. And so Kurt crawled along counting the different cylinders until he got to the sixth one, which is where they had replaced that piston. Meanwhile, the foreman went around to the aft hatch, he undid the three dogs, he opened up the hatch, and then using a remote-controlled device, he was able to bring the pistons into position safely so Kurt could inspect them through the scavenger port. The procedure on the ship was if you were inspecting one cylinder, the expectation was is you would inspect all of them. And that entire process took about an hour, and Kurt just didn't feel like doing it. He was tired, he had a bad day, he was hungry. And so after he was certain the new piston was working just fine, he kind of rushed his checks on the other cylinders, and after only about 20 minutes, he told the foreman that, yep, we're good, we can leave. So he and the foreman got out, they dogged their hatches, and they headed up to their rooms to change. Their captain had been told they had to leave port no later than 9.30 that night because a huge tanker was coming in and there'd be no space for them. But at 8 p.m., as everyone is running around prepping the ship, somebody noticed Kurt was not at his workstation. The chief engineer called down to the engine room to ask anyone down there if they had seen Kurt, but nobody had. 
So a sailor was sent down to Kurt's cabin to see if he was in there, but he wasn't. At this point, because they only had about an hour until they were departing, they had to find Kurt. So they sounded the alarm on their ship, which was a little bit premature, but they figured let's get everybody involved and just find Kurt. And so everybody stopped what they were doing and began searching the ship. During the search, a sailor was down near the scavenger air recovery space, and he noticed on the forward hatch, there was a little piece of rag poking out of the top right corner of the forward hatch, and the lower two dogs were not set. He knew they were having issues getting a good seal on this particular hatch because there was a divot in one of the O-rings. And so he figured someone must have put a rag right over that divot to try to help seal this hatch, and they just forgot to shut the two lower dogs. Now, it did cross this sailor's mind that Kurt could have gotten inside of the scavenger air recovery space and then somehow got locked inside, and so he did want to investigate. However, there was a very strict policy about who was allowed to actually open up the scavenger air recovery hatches, and it wasn't the sailor. It was only the foreman, the chief engineer, and Kurt. And so this sailor decided to play it safe and just close the lower two dogs and then told his superior that there was this weird rag poking out of the forward hatch and that someone should go down there and open it up and see if Kurt's inside. And so his superior went and told the chief engineer. And so as the chief engineer is making his way down to check on this strange rag situation, the foreman completely independently had gone around to the back of the scavenger unit to the aft hatch, so not the one with the rag poking out of it. And he unlocked the three dogs, he opened the hatch, he looked inside and shined his light, didn't see anyone, shut the hatch, locked all three dogs, and then began to walk away right as the chief engineer came down and saw him. And he saw him securing the scavenger air unit. And he said, hey, I was just coming down here to check to make sure Kurt wasn't in there. And you just checked, right? He's not in there. And the foreman said, yeah, no one's in there. It's all good. And so the two of them, the foreman and the chief engineer, did not check on the rag. They just left. The search for Kurt continued on the ship, but they could not find him. And so as 9.30 was approaching, the captain called the port authority. And he said, hey, we're down someone. Can you please send someone out to look around? And so a search on the land began, but they couldn't find Kurt. And so finally, 9.30 came around and the big container ship that was supposed to come in and take their place was just waiting right out in the water for them to leave. And so the captain did his best to linger for another 10, 15 minutes, but finally they were forced to leave even though they had no idea where Kurt was. So they fired up the engine and they left. The general consensus on the ship was that Kurt must have fallen overboard and drowned. Or maybe he ran ashore and ran off, but that was very unlike him. And so an investigation was launched, but it would probably be a while before anybody found out what happened to him. Finally, two days later, they arrived in port at Norfolk, Virginia. They powered off the engine and they got the ship ready to be put into harbor mode, where basically they open up all the hatches and they prep it to sit there for a while. And during that process, the foreman went down to the scavenger air recovery space and he opened up the forward hatch and he found Kurt. Although no one has all the details of what happened to Kurt, the leading theory is two days earlier when he had done that abbreviated check of the engine cylinders, when he had basically cut it short with the foreman because he just didn't want to do it, he had gotten back up to his room and started to think to himself that if anything goes wrong with any of those pistons, that I'm going to be to blame because the foreman was with me and I called the foreman lazy earlier and he doesn't like me and so he's bound to turn me in. So Kurt decided he would go back down and do a more thorough check. But he didn't want anybody to know he was second guessing himself, and so he was going to do this alone. Even though it was a huge no-no to go inside of the scavenger air unit by yourself. Because if you manage to get stuck in there by yourself, horrible things are going to happen to you, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But Kurt was confident, so he headed down, he undogged the forward hatch, he swung it inside, he climbed in with his flashlight, and then somehow, once he got inside, he managed to fall backwards and hit the hatch door so hard that it swung shut, slammed, causing the upper dog to swivel and rotate down and lock him inside. He knew that nobody knew he was in there. He had made sure that nobody knew he was in there. He screamed for help, but nobody could hear him. The ship was so loud as it was, and being inside of this tunnel, no sounds getting out of it. And so he's looking around thinking what he should do, and he looks back at the door, the one that's sealed right behind him, and he sees the very top crack, there's a tiny sliver of light. Because even though one dog had sealed him in, because the other two had not, there was a little gap in the seal. And so he thought if he can just wedge his dirty rag into that little space and push it out onto the other side, someone will see it, will clearly recognize there is a foreign object hanging off of the forward hatch, and they'll have to open it up and they'll find me. And so once he wedged his rag up and through, he was confident he would be found, and so he slouched down against the back of the hatch and he just sat there waiting to be found. And then a little while later, he heard the sound of somebody not opening the hatch behind him as he thought they would, 
but instead locking the two dogs, making sure it doesn't open. He must have got up and turned around and screamed for them, but again, they can't hear him. And then a couple of minutes later, on the other side of the tube, 55 feet away, the aft hatch opened up briefly. Somebody shined their light in. It didn't hit him. He tried to yell for them. They didn't hear him. And then he saw them shut the hatch and he heard the sound of them locking all three dogs. At this point, you gotta figure that Kurt's fear is at a primal level. He knows at any moment, if somebody doesn't get him out of here, this is gonna become a death trap. And so as he's looking around, just wondering what's gonna happen, he would have felt the incredible pressure start to build up in his ears. It would have taken him to his knees, it would have been crushing in his skull, and he would have heard the sound of each of the hatches being pressed up against their O-ring as the room began to pressurize. And then he would have heard the sound of the pistons beginning to churn inside of the engine cylinder right next to him. And at that point, he would know there's no hope. And slowly, horribly, that room would begin to heat up until Kurt was cooked alive. Our next story is called Wrong Door. On August 14th, 2012, Celestino Cervantes picked up 28-year-old Victor Diaz for work. Celestino was an expert roofer, and he had just hired Victor to come on his crew and help him with a particular job. This was going to be Victor's first day as a roofer, but for the past 10 years he had worked in construction, so he was familiar with the operation. The two men arrived at their job site in San Antonio, Texas around 8 a.m. that morning. They were in charge of putting a new roof on a 115-year-old building that was being redeveloped into a fancy steakhouse. Until 2001, this building had been used by a brewing company to house their enormous boilers. As such, this building was referred to as the Boiler House. Protruding from the boiler house roof was this large metal duct that was 15 feet long and almost looked like a covered walkway, and it connected to the side of this huge smokestack. This duct and smokestack used to be how the built-up condensation inside the boiler house was able to travel up and out of the building. When the two roofers got out of their truck, Celestino told Victor to take his tools and make his way up to the roof of the boiler house and get to work, and that he had a few things he had to do down on the ground floor, but he would be up to check on him in a little bit. Celestino turned around and was fiddling with his equipment inside of the truck while Victor made his way into the building and out of sight. An hour and a half later, Celestino went up to the roof to check on Victor, but he couldn't find Victor anywhere and he couldn't find his tools anywhere. So Celestino went back down into the main section of this building where other contractors that were working on this renovation were, and he began asking them, hey, have you seen this guy, Victor? He works with me, I can't find him, and no one had seen him. And so Celestino's thinking to himself, well, I guess Victor must have left, but that didn't really make any sense because Victor didn't have a vehicle and he didn't live nearby, but Celestino's thinking, you know what, maybe somebody came and picked him up. Now, unfortunately, Victor did not carry a cell phone, so nobody had any way of getting directly in contact with him. So Celestino leaves the building and he calls Victor's brother and he asks him, you know, have you seen Victor? Do you know where he might have gone? And Victor's brother says, no, I haven't seen him since this morning when he left with you. So Victor's brother began calling around to friends and family and asked them if they had seen Victor, but nobody knew where he was. So for the rest of the day, Celestino and the rest of Victor's friends and family, they went out looking for Victor at the job site and around the surrounding areas, but there was just no sign of him. And so that night, Victor's brother went to the police to file a missing person report. But the police told him that it was really too early to file a report because Victor was an adult and there was no sign of foul play and that he should just come back in a day or two if Victor still has not shown up. Two days go by and Victor had still not shown up, so Victor's sister-in-law went back to the police and says, okay, now I want to file a missing person report. We don't know where he is. No one can get in touch with him. We need your help. But the officer she spoke to told her that she still needed to wait another five days to process this request. It would turn out this was just not true. It was a mistake. There was no arbitrary waiting period to file a missing person report. So without any help from the police, Victor's friends and family and co-workers spent the next several days scouring San Antonio, scouring the job site, looking everywhere for him and handing out flyers and asking people if they'd seen him, but no one had, he had just disappeared. By Monday the following week, so six days after Victor has gone missing, his family had printed out dozens of these huge posters with his face on them and a number to call if you had any information about him, and their plan was to distribute them the following morning all over San Antonio. But the following morning, before they headed out, they got a call. Victor had been found. 
Seven days earlier, when Celestino told Victor to head inside and make his way to the roof and begin the project, Victor had gotten his tools, gone inside, he made his way up the stairwell to the second floor, and then he made a series of odd decisions. Instead of making his way to the access door and climbing his way up to the roof, he went to the far side of the second floor where there were all these wooden barriers preventing people from going any farther. He climbed over all these barriers and he reached the entrance to that huge duct where the condensation used to go. And so from his perspective, he would have been looking into this duct and it would have been completely pitch black because it connected to that smokestack and the smokestack was totally sealed off. But despite not having any idea where this tunnel goes, and it clearly not being the place Celestino told him to go, Victor decides to just get into this tunnel, which required bending over because it was only four feet tall and five feet wide. So he gets inside of this tunnel and he begins shuffling his way deeper and deeper into this tunnel until he reaches the end of the tunnel where it actually connects into the smokestack. Now at the top of this duct where it connects to the smokestack, there wasn't a grate or bars or any sort of barrier that would stop you from spilling into the smokestack. And because it was totally pitch black, Victor, when he made it to the edge of that duct, he just kept on walking and fell 20 feet down to the bottom of the smokestack. And so in total darkness, Victor, who was probably badly hurt from the fall, began feeling around the inside of the chimney looking for a way out. And he eventually found a hatch that was big enough for him to fit through. But when he felt up against it, he realized it was locked from the outside and it wouldn't even budge. He couldn't even get light to come in through a crack. It was totally sealed off. And that was the only way out of the smokestack unless he could get back up to the duct. But there was no way to do that. He most likely began screaming for help, but he was encased in thick brick, and so his sound wouldn't have traveled. It would have been completely muffled. Plus, the smokestack was fairly far away from the job site, which was very noisy as it is, and so there was just no way they could have heard him. And the smokestack and the duct were not part of the renovation, and so there was absolutely no foot traffic over around the smokestack. He was completely alone, no one knew he was there, and there was no way out. Seven days after Victor fell into the smokestack, workers over at the job site, they noticed this huge swarm of flies over around the base of the smokestack. There were so many flies over there, they decided they had to go investigate. And so as they walked closer and closer to the smokestack, they were hit with this overwhelming stench of death and decay. And then when they got to the smokestack, they could see the flies were centralized on that hatch at the bottom. And so they cut the lock, they opened it up, and inside they found Victor's body and they saw his hands were badly bloodied and bruised, and they were pressed up against the inside of the hatch, indicating in his final moments he was desperately trying to open that hatch and save himself, but there was just no way to do that. Although no one knows this for sure, it's believed Victor confused the condensation duct with the access point to the roof. The next and final story of today's episode is called Bones. In 2017, an electrician named Pete had become accustomed to doing work in basements and sub-basements of older buildings in Baltimore, Maryland. He discovered that many times when he worked in a stretch of older buildings right next to each other, that in the basement or sub-basement, there would be a stretch of tunnel that connected each building to each other, kind of like a common door in a hotel room. One day, Pete was asked to install some new lights in the sub-basements of three very old buildings that were all right next to each other. Apparently, someone had purchased the entire building complex after they had sat there abandoned for some time. When Pete arrived, his foreman, whose name was Mike, was waiting for him outside the farthest east building. And so Pete got out, walked up to the building, and Mike led him down to the basement and then down another flight of stairs into the sub-basement. The first thing Pete did was pull his flashlight out and look around and see if there was a tunnel connecting to the adjoining buildings, because if there was, it would make his life a lot easier. And sure enough, he shined his light to the west and there was a tunnel. And so he knew he wouldn't need to lug his gear up and over after he was done with each building. After that, Pete and Mike set up floodlights inside of that first sub-basement they were gonna be working in, and then they put their gear on and they got to work. 
After a few hours of Pete being really focused on what he was working on, he looked up and realized Mike was gone, and he assumed he must have gone upstairs for a lunch break, and Pete, who had had a really big breakfast, wasn't that hungry, but wanted to take a break, so he decided instead of eating, he would just go explore the other sub-basements. So Pete walked over to that first tunnel that went into the second building. He walked through it. It wasn't very far, maybe five or six feet to get into the next building. Once he got into that second building, it was totally dark because neither he nor Mike had actually gotten in there yet. And so Pete pulled his flashlight out and he scanned around the room and he saw directly on the other side, still going west across the building complex, was yet another tunnel connected to the third and final building. And so Pete walked through the second sub-basement, shining around, looking for anything interesting. There was nothing down there. He got to that tunnel, he walked through, and he entered into the third and final room of the entire building complex. And so he lifted his flashlight up and he scanned around the room, and he was shocked when on the other side, still going west, as if there was a fourth building, there was another tunnel. He kept his flashlight trained on this tunnel and he's thinking to himself, did I get something wrong here? Is there really four buildings? Cause I'm almost positive there was three. There shouldn't be a tunnel over there because there's no more buildings. And so he's really intrigued. And so he keeps his flashlight up and he starts walking across the room towards this tunnel. And he gets about halfway across this sub basement when he hears someone's voice come out of this mysterious tunnel. And it sounds an awful lot like Mike's. And Pete would say that his initial reaction to this was, oh, I guess Mike must have had his lunch break and then come back down here and started doing the same thing I'm doing, exploring the other sub basements. And so he's already checked out this tunnel and he wants to show me what's down there. So Pete walks over to this tunnel and he shines his light inside and right away he can tell it's different than the other two tunnels he's walked through because those went straight across and this tunnel he's looking at goes down and kind of bends off to the right. And so totally unconcerned because he believes Mike is down there already, he starts walking down this winding tunnel. After walking for a couple of minutes just straight down into this tunnel, he finally walks into this huge room with 20 foot high ceilings and he lifts his flashlight up and he looks around and there's no mic and he yells out for him, he doesn't hear him, but he noticed in the middle of the room were all these small animal skeletons that had been arranged in a big triangle on the ground. And as he scanned across the ground with his light, he came to the right side of the room at one of the points of the triangle. And at the top of that point was this large dog-like skeleton lying on the ground. It looked as if the triangle was more like an arrow and it was pointed at this one large dog. Pete went back to looking around the room and he saw right across from him was another tunnel entrance into more unexplored passageway. And for a second he thought about just turning around and leaving because this whole thing was starting to give him the creeps. But then he heard what sounded like Mike's voice again calling from that unexplored tunnel. And so he decided, okay, I'll walk a little bit farther to see what Mike wants. And so Pete carefully walked across this room, being careful not to step on any of the bones. And right before he walked into this new tunnel, he pulled his phone out in case he might have service and he could just call Mike and see what he wanted. But he had no service on his phone, so he entered the new tunnel. Unlike the other tunnel that went down the whole time, this new tunnel was totally flat, but it was a little bit more narrow. And so as he's walking, it's kind of zigging and zagging and it's just getting a little bit tight on his shoulders as he's moving. And after a couple of minutes of walking and yelling out for Mike and not hearing from him, he just stops and he just thinks, is this a good idea? Should I keep walking down this strange tunnel or should I just go back and meet Mike back up in the sub basement? And as he's standing there facing away from the direction he just came, he thinks he hears something behind him. So Pete turns around and shines his light and there's no one there. He yells out for Mike and Mike doesn't yell back. And then Pete hears the faint clicking sound of something moving on all fours in the chamber he had just come from. And he's thinking to himself, what could have gotten down here? There's only one way in and I've taken the other tunnel. Did I miss some dog that was staying in the middle there? I think I would have seen an animal that was moving around. And so as he's thinking about this, he realizes the clicking sounds have stopped. It's gone completely silent. And so he stops and he's just intently listening. And then all of a sudden, whatever it is out there starts running at full speed down the tunnel towards Pete. And so Pete immediately turns around and starts sprinting down this unexplored tunnel. All he hears behind him is this animal at full sprint grunting and bouncing into walls as it gains on him. And finally, after what felt like an eternity, but was probably only a few seconds, Pete gets to the end of this tunnel and he sees it's a small flight of stairs to a large metal door. He runs up and he grabs the door and he tries to open it and it opens. He runs outside, pulls it shut, hears it click, and then he sinks down with his back against the door, pressing up against it to ensure it stays shut. And as Pete is sitting there, he hears this thing come barreling into the room where this door is, and it rams into the door, and he feels it shake the door forward, but the door holds. And then whatever it was just lost interest, turned around and left. 
Even though this animal appeared to be gone and the door appeared to hold, Pete stayed sitting with his back up against the door for a couple of minutes while he composed himself. He really didn't know what to make of what just happened. Because he's thinking to himself, that animal had to have been huge. It just nearly barreled this door down. I felt the whole door shake. I mean, if that's a dog, that is a huge dog. And also, where's Mike? Mike's the whole reason I went into this tunnel in the first place. He was calling to me, or so I thought he was, and I never saw him. And so Pete's totally confused and he's traumatized and he's looking around and he's finally taking stock of where he is and he realizes he's under one of the docks of what would turn out to be the Four Seasons Hotel, which meant he was at least about a half mile away from where he had started in the sub-basement of those buildings. Pete stood up and made his way up to the sidewalk where he called Mike. And Mike was very confused at what Pete was telling him because he said, I never went into that tunnel. I never went into the other sub-basements. At my lunch break, I just went upstairs and got a bite to eat, and when I came down, you were gone. And so Pete started talking about the animal he saw, and as he was describing it, he's thinking to himself how crazy he must sound, and he began to realize that it just, it had to be, you know, a stray dog got in there, and he just must not have seen it, and, and that was it. And so after they hang up, Pete is left thinking to himself, you know, if that was a stray dog, then what were those bones arranged in that triangle for? And why did they seem to be an arrow pointing at that other bigger dog? And also, who was yelling to me inside of the tunnel if it wasn't Mike? But when Pete and Mike got back to those old buildings, they did not do any more exploration. It was like they were just not going to talk about what happened. Instead, they put a fold-up table in front of that tunnel that led down to the room filled with bones and whatever animal was down there. And they rushed the job in all the sub-basements, cut all the lights up as fast as they could. The last thing they did was they moved the table back out of the way and then ran up out of the building and never looked back. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please offer the Amazon Music Follow button a scoop of their favorite ice cream, but slip an elephant laxative into it first. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. If you want to check out our merch, join our Discord server, or just see what's going on at Ballin Studios, head on over to our brand new website, ballinstudios.com. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, 